Okay. Yes. So welcome everyone to uh, part three of Our Lady's Toolbox with Dr. Charles Gray. <laughs> um, as you know, you can find us on um, Twitter. You can find us on Meetup. Um, we are the three organizers waving right now. Wave, wave, wave. That's Elisa, Kyla, and me. Um, you can find all of us on Twitter. Follow us there. Um, that's our brilliant logo if you're not already familiar with it and we would just like to tell you the series that are going on right oh sorry before that we turn two in uh four days we celebrate our second birthday and we are very proud and very happy and since we can't celebrate in person like we did last year we just wanted to take a second here to be like happy birthday us <laughs> And um, we have two series going on um, from Jan to May this year. You probably have heard of them since we've seen your names and faces pretty often now. Um, we have the Our Ladies Toolbox series where we had Jan and Feb with um, academic analysis and presenting results. This series is a little more advanced, but at the same time, we also have the Zero to Shiro series um, targeted at Tidyverse and more basic wrangling manipulation. And there we've already had introduction to Tidyverse and Tidy Data. Our Ladies Toolbox is the first um, Wednesday of every month and the Zero to Shiro is the third Wednesday of every month. So you have those to look forward to. Um, for both the series, if you drop your whole, like your end, like full name in the chat, um, you've probably been doing that for the first two as well. Um, and if you've attended all five in the series, um, we will give you a certificate at the end of it saying you attended all the events in the series. Um, and again, we would like to thank the University of Freiburg, uh, University of Education in Freiburg for the Our Ladies Toolbox series for funding us for this. Um, we of course have Charles's amazing talk today, but you also have to look forward to uh, part three wrangling for Zero to Shiro um, in two weeks. We then have the two in April. We have Our Lady's Toolbox Part 4, which is version control uh, by Kristen, Our Lady's Global and Berlin. Um, we then have Zero to Shiro Part 4, visualization. And we finish May with a panel discussion on women in science and what it's like to be women in science. Um, and to wrap it all up, more wrangling and GG plot. <laughs> Very excited for Charles's talk today. Um, in fact, I have been excited to hear her speak for two years now because she was supposed to visit Freiburg two years ago and because of again stupid bureaucracy she couldn't actually come and spend time with us in Freiburg even though she was in Heidelberg at that point. Um, and I've been waiting to hear her speak since then. She is currently, um, she just finished her PhD in interdisciplinary computational meta science, <laughs> I think. Um, she's starting her postdoc um, at Newcastle. She works with Bayesian networks, meta-analysis with the Cochrane um, reviews. And I love this quote from her bio, uh, from the bio she gave us, which says, degrees in art, music, and mathematics, and none of these prepared her for the real interdisciplinary computational meta-analysis doctoral thesis in R. And I absolutely love how um, you can bring all of these different things together and we look forward to your talk. And with that, over to you. Ah, oh, thank you, Tivia, that was lovely. I'm very excited to be uh, presenting to our ladies Freiburg. Am I saying Freiburg? Freiburg. Freiburg, Freiburg, I'm very excited. I need to start learning to speak, um, pronounce European names um, better because I am moving to Europe. All right, sharing desktop two. And hopefully this will present her work. Yes, okay, cool. So I'm here to talk to you. I, I'm here to share a message, if you will, of I think it's good enough to fail at reproducible science. That's, that's the main point I wanted to discuss and, um, and share with you. And I'm really interested in your thoughts on this topic, all of you. So to begin with, what do I mean by failing. Well, for starters, we could think of this as a, you know, we've got to have a little bit of stats in here because this is our stats, of course. For every, if we might, we might think, well, for every five successes, we have theta failures. 
and we can think of the proportion of success, the proportion that we're likely to succeed is the number of successes divided by the total number of successes and failures. And then we have all trials for our binomial distribution being given by the total number of successes and the total number of failures. So we end up with this, we often think of, of science and practicing science as a function of success. So we might envisage it as a binomial distribution with these parameters. But today I want to talk about the part of the equation that we often gloss over that we, um, I'm just going to stick my timer on so I have some sense of how long we've been talking. Um, we think of science as this function of success and by in, in so doing, I think we hide the failure component so today I wanna to really drive down into that idea of the parts of science and in particular reproducible scientific analysis in R that we fail at and share some stories. And hopefully I get to hear your stories too. So there's a, there's a fairly standard structure to a PhD in statistical science. I was enrolled in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics and ostensibly I was to do a PhD in statistics. And the usual structure for that is you come up with some new mathematics and you then take that mathematics and turn it into some code that you can use to generate a manuscript that will publish your results, as well as follow up with a some kind of software tool in R that implements the mathematics that you came up with. So far, so good. But I've colored in mathematics green because that's the part where the standard training ends. And after that, everything is self-taught. The parts about the code and the paper and the tool, that's the parts that were left out of my education. In statistics, I find I was well prepared in terms of looking at equations, but everything else was really, felt like the wild west when I was starting out. And on all of these counts, I feel like I kind of failed. Um, the mathematics that we came up with in my doctoral thesis, that's the title page from my doctorate, the, the mathematics that we came up with, we, we knew that it, it worked. And what we had was an estimator for the variance of the sample median. You don't really need to know or understand um, what my thesis was about in order to follow this talk. But for those of you who are interested of very briefly described. So we had a, an estimator for the variance of the sample median. And in meta-analysis, what you need in order to perform a meta-analysis using the conventional tools that exist in R, uh, which would be the metaphor package primarily, uh, we need an effect, but we also need the variance of the effect. Now, if you have means and standard deviations reported, this is fine. But often in a meta-analysis, you may be analyzing mediums where they report an interquartile range. And that's not a variance. It's a measure of spread, but not a variance. So we had this way of estimating the variance. But did the maths work? We think it did because we showed under simulations that it works really nicely for a whole wide range of cases. But why the maths works, I don't know. I didn't discover that. I ended up spending so much time with the code that I didn't get to spend, you know, heaps of fun time exploring mathematical questions I didn't know the answers to. But then the code itself, well, I was meant to succeed on code, except that the whole thing was just a complete mess. My, um, my, my, my project became known as the dumpster fire for the last couple of years, where it just felt like a dumpster fire of code that was broken, or I didn't know whether or not it was broken. And of course, you're meant to publish papers, but because of all the breaking and the code and the mathematics not being sure, I didn't end up publishing any of the papers I intended to. Potentially, I could now, but I'm pretty keen to move on to new papers and new projects. And then the tool. The tools, I developed software, but did I develop some kind of software tool that I, you know, tell people to go home and use? I'm not sure. There are certain use cases where it will be fine, but 
I'd probably want to consult with someone. So in a sense, I feel like I, I, I failed at every aspect of my doctorate. This whole standard structure to doing a PhD in statistics, I felt like was a total failure. And at times, the only thing that propelled me along in the project was the thought that if I gave up now, then all this time and all this broken maths and broken code would be a waste. And I just couldn't bear the thought of wasting that much of my life and getting nothing out of it. And then there were times where it was fun. But today I want to share some of the, the I think that we often, once you know, now that I've, ah, oh, finished my doctorate and started a postdoc, it all looks very clean. And I want to like really get into the details of how it wasn't a clean process. It was a frustrating process. It was uh, a disheartening process at times, but it was ultimately very much worthwhile. And I didn't end up publishing papers or writing the code that I intended to, but I ended up publishing completely different papers and really discovering new areas of interest where uh, my, my PhD ended up sitting very much in what my, my new advisor and my postdoc, he talks about evidence-based X, where what we're interested in is our evidence-based research methods, evidence synthesis methods, uh, of which meta-analysis is one component. And we're interested in how we can you know, learn to do evidence synthesis well and how we can apply it to X. But X could be ecology, it can be psychology, it can be um, clinical medicine, um, it can be all manner of things. So right now I'm working with ecologists and I'm also working with psychologists and I'm working with people in biomedical research because meta-analysis is used really broadly. So I'm not in any one discipline, I'm an evidence-based X person. But to add to that, by investigating all these different workflows and tools that we're going to talk about today, I also ended up reframing my PhD in terms of research software engineering applied to X. So evidence-based X and RSE X. And I, it was not about a specific application, but more about how do we practice statistical science in this new era of reproducibility. So it was very fortuitous when Divya got in touch with me and said, would you like to give a talk in this, um, in this series? Because the topic was reproducibility, something on reproducibility. And I thought, well, I've actually just written an entire doctorate on reproducible data analysis in R. So I have quite a lot to talk about and quite a lot to talk about in terms of failing. But another term that I used in the, in the title slide, it's good enough to fail. So I've talked a bit about what failure might mean. And now to just touch on the term good enough. There, I first encountered the term good enough in Greg Wilson's follow-up paper to his first paper, which was best practices in scientific computing. And then three years later follows up with good enough practices in scientific computing. And where you know, we question whether or not best practice is attainable for a lot of people. And maybe we should just aim for something that's good enough. Now, I tried to do a good enough reproducible scientific analysis for my PhD, but it ended up feeling like I was failing even at that. And it was endlessly frustrating, but now, that I'm starting a new project and I'm, I'm getting to reap all the rewards of all my failures. I think it was a highly worthwhile um, process to even try to be good enough and fail at it. So uh, the, other, the term good enough also pops up in psychology. So it's, it's used in terms of good enough parenting, for example, to get people away from the idea of some perfect parenting that you can always be the perfect parent to your children or good enough friendship, where we aim to be, you know, we're never going to be the perfect supportive friend every single day, but we can aim to be a good enough friend. So good enough pops up in all sorts of contexts, but always it's this idea of doing our best isn't going to happen every single day. So, you know, what constitutes good enough? So 
oh, I'm moving the wrong slides. And now I've got them out of sync. Bear with me. Put in our sign. All right. That, okay. So I posit, I hope that through this discussion, we, we end up agreeing that failing is the best we can do at good enough reproducible science. And this is okay, because if we failed, that means you actually tried. And if you try, well, you're never gonna get everything right in computational science. In a sense, trying is the best we can do and you will fail, but as you fail and succeed at adopting reproducible practices in your scientific analysis, you'll discover useful workflows and connect with others and find new ways to collaborate that um, will certainly surprise me. So what do I mean by reproducible scientific analysis in R? In one way, and, in, and today, I, the way I'm going to think about it is we can think of the practice of reproducible scientific analysis in R as a collection of different techniques that solve different problems associated with reproducible analysis. So on one hand, we've got uh, markdown driven development, which provides us a way of including the code inside the manuscript that we've written which is um, very nice in terms of reproducibility if someone can simply open a document and follow your argument and then find the points that, and then the code corresponds to the point in the argument that you're referring to. Sounds like it solves a great problem, but as we will discuss, there are many pitfalls. Uh, functions and documentation of functions is another area that we could think of as a different technique that we can develop this, the, there, why do we care about this in the context of reproducibility? Well, saying why, why do I want to be able to reproduce another analysis? Why is reproducibility important? Well, primarily, I'd say that in a scientific analysis, it's so we can validate our results. And there are secondary benefits to reproducibility. It's so others can, others can validate our results as well, but also so others can see the code that we've come up with and extend on our ideas. And functions are a really nice way to, to share um, our code and make it a bit more accessible. And so what do I mean by accessible? Well, that's readable to another user. And that other user in terms of the benefits of reproducibility, I find it's just as useful to think of that end user person as either someone else completely, but also my future self. Because often when I come back to an analysis and I want to use some component of that analysis, I've forgotten the whole kind of thread of it. I've forgotten what was important or where the bits were. And so documenting our functions ostensibly helps with that so that we can see what each little section of code does and we have different ways we can document that and provide information to ourselves, our future selves or to other people about that code. Sounds like it solves lots of problems, but as we'll discuss, it's complicated. Git and version control, uh, I don't know about you, but just hearing the word Git kind of makes me wanna huff into a paper bag. I've had so many problems with grappling with um, Git merge conflicts and things like that. But of course, you know, having more robust version control, what is the problem it solves? Well, it's, you know, ostensibly it's to help us avoid ending up with a, you know, a, a directory where we have so many different versions that each have, you know, appended to the file name, final version to final final version. And version control solves this problem by giving us one document that we can ostensibly surf the history. Sounds like it solves a problem, should be simple, but no. And then uh, testing and workflow of functions and data. And, uh, and the workflow and testing, this has been one of the, um, the biggest challenges for me. Uh, why do we care about this? Well, quality assurance is kind of boring 
but there's some really good reasons to include, to test that our code is doing what we think that it's doing, because we've seen that there's been a number of retractions and data scandals in the last few years where data has been included in a paper and errors were made in the data cleaning or data extraction process that weren't picked up downstream because where that happens can be so hidden and if we don't test or build in checks into our analysis we can end up with um, not so much fraud although that's a possibility too but more that we can balk our analysis through errors with the data wrangling so testing and quality assurance and adopting good workflows solves the problem, right? And finally, you know, our, our end output is this manuscript, which, you know, should be this glorious thing, but where we, you know, just hit knit and everything just reproduces on your machine, but it's never so simple. And so in this workshop, what I'm going to do is reflect on these different techniques and give you some examples from my own work about where I failed and things that have gone horribly wrong for me, but how those failures are now helping me with the current analysis. Uh, and then I'll touch on a few key resources for each of these techniques that I found particularly useful for getting myself out of uh, feeling like a complete failure at this particular component of reproducibility. And then I'll open it up to discussion and I, very, very much hoping that people will jump in with their own stories. I'm hoping that by sharing my stories of failing, you will share your stories of failing and make me feel better about failing. So this is, you know, somewhat selfishly structured talk. So in the spirit of that, we now commence and we start to dive into um, dive into the details on the code. But before we begin, I, I'd, I'd like to say I'm releasing the code of this talk under this license that Veronica, who's here, um, put me onto and who's um, How I Fail blog I mentioned at the start. And I've got a link to that, um, our blog post that just came out yesterday in this slide. Um, but she put me onto this very cool license that was designed by someone doing scientific analysis and and the computation and what i really like about it is that it highlights these two things that are particularly important to us as scientific analysts that we want our code to validate the results that we're presenting but secondly far more importantly it should absolve us of shame and repudiation and embarrassment for the code that we give because we're not trying to produce perfect software and the goals of software produced for scientific analysis, I think are really quite different to our goals in, in producing software in general. And I think we can adopt the practices from software engineering that can really, you know, um, supercharge our scientific analyses. But I think it's worth reflecting. And I think, you know, in this talk I'm reflecting and I'm hoping that by hearing your fails, it will give me further insights into the differences and the unique differences for scientific analysis computation and how we use software engineering tools within this context. Because we're far more interested in, in the process of developing our code and our analyses than we are in, in making sure that it's robust to how an end user uses it. There are really different things we care about. So on to our first topic, markdown driven development. So the before. The idea with markdown driven development is that you have a, um, a document in which you have your words, for your analysis and potentially some maths as well. Uh, in my case, I, you know, there's almost always some models and whatnot. And, and then you also have the code. And this just seemed brilliant for my PhD. But this is what the end result ended up being. You know, when I got to the final end and I finally just wanted to submit a PDF that had everything in it, 
just the text structure of a book is complicated enough in and of itself, but then making it reproducible was a whole nother challenge. And I had so many different iterations of this with, uh, you know, at first it was just um, our projects that were saved on my Dropbox and I hadn't learned about packaged analyses. And then I came across this stuff to do with packaged analyses and I got really excited about that. But the papers, then I ended up structuring my projects in packaged analyses associated with the papers, but the papers are chapters in the document. And then the, the thesis document itself needs a whole kind of book structure, which is this, you know, meta level. And of course, when you're working with um, tech, LaTeX syntax, um, which for those of you who don't use LaTeX, it's a lot like Markdown. It's a write-up language. So it's a way of um, formatting your output PDF. And, but you can include R inside it. And so for some of my chapters, they, they began as papers that were um, in just LaTeX form where I had lots of maths in this one. But then for subsequent chapters where they became, so in this chapter, it was heavily involved, um, heavily looking at my simulation code. I wrote this in R NoWeb and wrote these chapters in our studio and then ended up with this like just awful mix of writing the chapters that were in tech in Overleaf and because the debugging for Overleaf was better for tech than writing in R and when I tried to use Atom on my machine so that I could just compile my LaTeX files locally it kept crashing and in the end because I wanted to get the thesis written, I ended up in a, you know, I ended up writing in this just completely convoluted way. And there was nothing clean or neat about it. And there were points at which, and in this one, there was actually, you know, sometimes data chucked into the chapter and called in, but then in other chapters and in other components, I'm using packages that I built up as a packaged analysis. The whole thing ended up as a, cluster of mess of there are R scripts, there are no web files, there are tech scripts, there's PDF output, there's figures, some of the figures are you know hard coded by necessity and then some of the figures wherever I could I tried to make them these reproducible things. So if we go into this file, this is where I've got um, this is what a, a code chunk looks like in our no web. It's got a slightly different syntax than the three back ticks, but it has this uh, double like quack quacks um, on the outside and this at symbol to end the chunk. But this is a code chunk and you can see your usual, you know, things where I'm loading packages and that kind of thing. And here's, we've got text and we've got code chunks with that are calling a different packaged analysis. So even though this itself is reproducible, if you install my packaged analysis, there are sort of multiple layers to this, um, to just you know how I built up the thesis document and trying to keep it in um, one you know neat document never ended up happening, and it ended up being many many. Um, different iterations that got messier by the uh, by the iteration and I've gotten my slides out I think yet again back to start let's just resync my slides and this is the first time I've used presenter mode with um, IO slides and I keep clicking on the wrong screen it's got two screens it's very good except that I keep touching the wrong screen no touching. So here are some of the, the resources that really helped me. Oh, I didn't show you the after. That's right. So after, so there was this horrible mess, but how is this helping me now? Well, it is. Um, so this is the paper that I'm currently writing and just today I got in my very first network that I built up and I feel like all those failures and all the messes they've really helped me collect my thoughts and be a lot clearer about why I want to include code in the document 
And something that really occurred to me today was as I build up this, um, this analysis where I need to consult with various people, I need to consult with the data extraction um, researchers, and I also need to consult with various different um, high level medical people about the components of the model. So having a really clearly outlined pipeline is really useful for me to have as a reference in the paper as I'm working on it. I'll hide this code when I, you know, come time to publish. But for now, I'm showing it so me and my advisor can easily see where all the different components are. And here I've got a single packaged analysis and I've got a really clear pipeline for myself of what I intended to do. So I have a reading in my data and then grabbing the raw names of the files because I'm using that for keyword matching. Then passing through the data through a standard cleaning function, the, the kinds of things I do on just about any data set. So using janitor clean names, for example, which if you haven't used it, is the best. It takes all the, it doesn't matter how messy your column headers are. And in my data set, they are so messy. And it um, removes white space and symbols and replaces them. So in my data set, it's replaced the percentage symbols with the word percentage, and it's replaced the white space with underscores. So handy. And then I have engineering that's that's common to all of the analyses, dependent on a keyword. And then once I've gotten the that that basic engineering down, where I manipulate the data into a particular shape, a particular um, long format by study and arm, then I want to pass it through some more engineering that will finesse specific to the model. And it's really exciting to see the code that I've been working on and all these little bits and pieces and this quite heavy duty uh, engineering stuff that I've been doing on the back end where um, we're working with a data set that's exploded from the first import had three and a half thousand columns to um, the next one had 5,000 columns and now we're almost at 6,000 columns. Because of the way this, this uh, evidence synthesis data entry software works for the data extractors who are going through study by study with their clinical minds and doing this and extracting the pertinent clinical details and statistics into this software. It then outputs this big CSV that's just messy. And I've never had a, an applied modeling um, puzzle to work on where this hasn't been a huge issue where cleaning the data isn't a, you know, a massive undertaking. So even though I failed with all of these things, I feel like I, um, all those mistakes are now culminating now that I'm trying to write a whole new analysis and I'm making use a lot of, of a lot of these skills that I failed at in the past with building notebook driven uh, analysis and um, oh, is janitor clean name something people use a lot? In my circle, yes, it's come up a lot as a, a very uh, common, uh, just pops up a lot in, in conversations that I have with other data engineers, um, other research software engineers. And um, yeah, I, I've been using it for quite a while. I swear by that function. Um, and yeah, so even though those failures were really frustrating, I, they are helping tenfold now. So I'm interested in, oh, um, next slide. Is, and I've done it again. I've got it out of sync back. And it's presentation slide. Right. So um, here are some references. These are these are just some really specific references that helped me nut out particular problems that I was struggling with. I, Emily Ritter has got an, a really fantastic blog on markdown driven development and thinking about how you take a big long script that you have in your notebook and how you give it some more structure. Um, also, the R Markdown Definitive Guide textbook is a, a resource that I go to constantly and never stop looking up. Uh, and finally, the resource I wanted to mention was this blog post by Carl Broman about 
on NoWeb, which if you write um, PDF uh, LaTeX documents a lot, is um, this was this completely unlocked it for me. I, I'm now able to use LaTeX with R in the same way that I can use Markdown and R together um, using R Markdown. So for me, RMD and RNW are, are kind of two sides of the same coin. So now I'd like to open it up to you. I'd love to hear your stories of uh, failing at um, using Markdown and, you know, things that you've really struggled with, things that you've, um, that, you know, wins that you've had and things that you've learned from. I guess there are also um, two questions first, Charles. First, is janitor clean name something people use a lot? Yeah, so uh, in my experience, yes, I've come across it a lot, like it's popped up um, a lot. The I, I don't use a lot of the other functions from janitor. I should look into what else it has, but it's, it's my go-to for when I import a data set. anyone would like to um, unmute themselves and just join in the conversation that's totally awesome or just um, write in the chat no Veronica I, I thought your joke was really funny <laughs> <laughs> say it out loud um, but I can and uh, so Veronica says maybe janitors of the future will do a data scientist colon clean underscore floor <laughs> Yeah, so has everyone like have has everyone else found using Markdown to have you had a smooth time? I think Janelle wanted to say entire... something. Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah. Hi, okay. So well maybe my situation with uh, Markdown is um a little special in this case because I'm working with patient data on a secure server. So <sighs> So, you know, this interest and this push and, you know, using reproducible practices. Oh, I'm so enthusiastic. I was all fired up. And, uh, you know, I got my packages and things uh, uploaded to the server and working. And I can knit to HTML, but um, I need special permission to export that file. And I found out I can, I can, you know, uh, I can knit to Word. Once again, I need to export that file. But the thing is, is that when you want to like share that or get corrections or whatever, then my supervisor says, you know, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about with R Markdown, you know, so that compatibility thing has been a little bit of a challenge as well as, um, there's so much you can do locally that's just easier. So, so I am, you know, gonna carry on, but it's been a, it's been a challenge for me that aspect. And um, yeah, one more comment about that was probably, you know, I'm I'm also playing a little bit right now with um, our notebook because. I was thinking, okay, so some of the guys there built a version of GitHub that's a light version and they installed it on the server. So I can use version control with this light, you know, Git light, Gitea it's called. And um, so that's fine. I tried even installing like workflow so I could have some type of a project or workflow like that. It's just, you know, spending the time to get it all to work together in a very secure environment. So that's I think it's really interesting points that firstly, the um, working with protected data and um, and yeah, I, I so 
connect with that. Like I've had um, multiple instances where, uh, you know, I'm all excited about building my, my markdown driven or my, you know, tech driven with my code chunks all in there and fully reproducible document. But what happens when the analysis is dependent on things that we want to protect and, um, and privacy issues to do with the data. So maybe the data's got email addresses in it, or maybe it's an insecure thing, or maybe people want to share the document, but not have it completely available online for the public to see, because um, I've had a lot of collaborators who are worried about our results getting scooped and that kind of thing. And that's an eternal challenge. But I think the other thing that you highlighted that um, really, that's an even bigger problem for me is the more I go down these complex reproducible documents, the more it poses a challenge in terms of working with other collaborators. And like, I have worked on a GitHub blog post via HackMD and I'd, I'd like to, one of you know, the things on my never, you know, ever increasing to-do list of things to look into is whether I can use HackMD to um, you know, edit a markdown paper that's got code chunks in it. But the, you know, the further I go down this route, the harder it gets to just simply, you know, talk to each other and comment yeah. like we can on, say, a Google Doc. And I don't think there are, you know, simple answers. And like, I think a part of today is highlighting that, you know, for every, for every problem we fix, we create brand new problems for ourselves. And so it's great to adopt reproducible workflows. And I, I do think there's lots of benefit. And I, you know, I, I hope that um, in today's talk, I will share that with you. Um, but today, I, yeah, I want to highlight precisely these things, because often we talk about the positives without really uh, you know, talking about what goes wrong once we've, you know, fixed one problem, we create these brand new problems. Like collaborative documents, I, I find the more I go down this reproducible document route, the less collaborative the document is. Yeah. Does anyone else have, um, would anyone else like to jump in with a comment? There's an interesting discussion going on on the chat. If you want to. Oh, yeah. Ah, <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, whole... Docker. That is like so on my <laughs> list. Of, you know, it's this ever increasing list of tools and techniques that I need to learn. And I know containerization will be this huge boon, but it's just yet another thing to learn. Yeah, there's a whole um, losing time to R versus Python versus MATLAB versus. <laughs> Um, now learning new things. So, yeah. Fantastic. Also, people can just chime in, you know, just unmute yourself and um, start ranting. That's completely fine. Spent five years learning MATLAB. I don't know any MATLAB. I've tried to um, unpick MATLAB, but... I actually really relate to that because I my entry to R was delayed considerably because everyone insisted on using MATLAB. And at some point I just said, if no one's teaching me how to do this, I'm just going to a community that teaches me how to do this. <laughs> so I left and that's how I came to R. Um, but and I also R lost a lot of time. Thing. With R, the community is so much better. Yeah, I mean, if you have and to self-learn the software. Any of the others. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. When I compare it with learning Fortran, which admittedly was in the dark ages and, and I prefer to forget about it, it's like oceans apart. <laughs> I mean, really, any language that doesn't know you put a comma in because it's in the 81st column has to die. It doesn't do oh. that anymore, but it did when I learned. The amount of time <laughs> I've spent in R looking for missing commas or semicolons. Yeah. Or, uh... At but at least you don't have to go in three days. Five, ten, fifty. Oh god, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> it thought it was still on punch cards. <laughs> oh yeah, I feel this. And you know, I know I'm going to feel this way about my own analysis and my own code in five to ten years, but mm -hmm. it's the way it goes. So I might move on to the um maybe I'll start sharing and go to the next next set of slides.
Git. <laughs> I, I would posit that uh, for the horror stories that we have to do with Markdown, surely we have far worse stories to tell about Git. Um, so Git is meant to solve our version control problems so that we don't end up with files that are, you know, these long trailing things and you can't tell which version. Um, I, I know my, a friend of mine is collaborating with people who are using, he's trying to get people to use the Google Docs presentation to, uh, you know, collaborate on this workshop that they're developing with people across the state, but people keep downloading it, converting it to PowerPoint, and then saving it back up to the Dropbox as a PowerPoint with your know, underscore version. That's just one example of how even when you're using a supposedly version controlled uh, system, you know, it, it can fail. And I have some pretty notable failures with my PhD. So if I go across to um, GitHub now and I, I went looking for the repository that my thesis code was in today and realized that if I type in thesis, I get a repo that says thesis. And then when I looked at it, I went, this is um, the thesis document. And then I also typed in dumpster fire because I knew, so this was some, and yeah. And then I looked at it and went, oh, I haven't updated this for two years. So this was some version of my thesis that I then discontinued and then got so annoyed with the whole thing that I rebooted and started a whole new repo. And I knew that the PDF was called dumpster fire. So if I type in dumpster fire, I have um, this user, rather embarrassingly, I have dumpster fire and dumpster fire old, but neither of these are the thesis. They're older iterations of the thesis. So this one, I must've been working on it until the 12th of April and then went, no, 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 I'm gonna reboot the repo and <laughs> created a brand new repo, call this one dumpster fire old, but no, this one hasn't been updated since the 15th of April. This isn't the thesis. And then I realized that the thesis was called, um, I, I called the repo because I was now, you know, out of my like obvious names for it being thesis and dumpster fire. I called it what the, you know, what it says on the title page, which is measure of code proof. And this is the repo in which the final, you can see here four months ago, that's when I submitted my PhD for examination. So here's the final thing. And so even though I was meant to be doing this wonderful version control thing, I just, I, even then I ended up with versions of my version controlled document. And much is, uh, you know, much is made of being able to surf across versions. But I must admit that in amongst, you know, everything that I'm trying to master in undertaking a PhD in, this meta-analyzing mediums topic, I had lots of things to learn. One of them was Git, but how much Git do I really want to learn? You know, how much is actually useful for my good enough practices? And in the end, I, you know, mostly just focused on pulling and pushing and just having a, you know, a safe place to keep my code. Was I able to surf back across versions and then like pluck out bits and use them, that is still a skill that I have yet to level up to. Um, very occasionally I'd be able to go back in time and, and use something, but almost never was that useful. It was mostly useful in the sense that I had an online place that I kept um, where I was working and I had issues that I could open up and manage my project. And if I feel like um, you know, instead of adopting all these fabulous, you know, perks of the Git version control system, I really only ended up using the project management aspect of GitHub and the fact that it's a way of, you know, saving my, um, my, my work. And saving is important to me because I am from, I did my first degree in arts in back in the dark ages. Uh, where I got my first email address and I actually had the um, the moment happen the night before an essay was due I and this was when we were using three and a half inch floppy disks I had a three and a half inch floppy disk that I was backing up my my essay onto and managed to balk the save and create a bug 
when I was saving the document such that I deleted both the saved version on the three and a half inch floppy and the version on my local computer and had to rewrite the essay at three in the morning. And, you know, and I'm looking at the clock going, I'm so tired. And now I have to rewrite the entire essay because it's due tomorrow. And I always left my essays till the last minute in my arts degree. Uh, I enjoy science a lot more than arts. And so what are the things that I, you know, what are the good enough practices that are really, you know, blowing my mind at the moment? Um, during the whole course of my PhD, our studio went through, you know, various updates. And one of the updates were, enabled me to just copy my GitHub uh, repo. I could just create a GitHub repo and then copy the URL for that repo into the create project wizard in our studio. So it pops up with this box you click through from, and I'll show you that. Oh, time to open our studio. Um, clicking across to our studio now. Um, when I click on um, new project, it gives me a little wizard and I can choose version control, choose Git and just copy the URL in here, which if I grab myself one of my um, a GitHub repository link. Um, and I grab, say, the SSH, and it fills in by, from my SSH link from the GitHub repo, uh, which I just copied over from this here. So I went to my GitHub repository and I clicked on code, grabbed the SSH, dropped it in to this create project, and then I'd hit create project, but I already have Happy Pill Pain because it's right here, so I'm not going to hit create pill, um, create project right now, but this little box saved me a lot of time. And um, I think people highlight a lot of, you know, really fancy things you can do with Git, but really just having the project management and having a place where I'd stored my files and where I knew that they were backed up was a lot for me and being able to see which commits. I did manage to figure out how to tag my commits to my issues. So then I could see what changes were associated with what particular issues in the project that I was dealing with. But really this is as far as I've got in Git. And um, one of the, the biggest fails that I have was I spent a huge amount of time trying to solve and resolve merge conflicts and, and issues with Git. And I've come out with and I share my various, you know, repos with you in the spirit of, ah, you know, there's something to be said for the number one rule of Git is you can just burn it down and start again. And this is my, my number one um, lifesaver with Git. I have unsynced my slides again. Clicking the wrong thing. Here we go. Um, so in terms of how working with Git is helping my life now. Having this, when I'm working on my own, being able to set up a project and have it automatically linked to the repositories, really handy. Um, the other tool that I started to make a lot of use of is the GitHub command line interface. Uh, I, I use it constantly um, and it helps me. So this is from the command line um, bash in my um, R Studio. I go to the terminal and I can check out the issues associated with um, this GitHub issue list using the GH for GitHub command line interface. And this will output all of the issues that I have open in this particular repo, which I find really, really useful. Um, I can also view those via the web. If I just add a little tag, it'll open up in my browser those same issues. And it's, I failed at using version control for, you know, going back to my functions, but I ended up finding this, you know, one arguably far more simple aspect of using Git to be really handy and useful. And so despite the fact that I was, I kept feeling like I was failing at the actual version controlling part, I found that with burning it down 
And with the project management, uh, the, the frustrations of Git were worthwhile or are worthwhile. The other set of um, the other tools that I wanted to highlight uh, in this talk that have been particularly helping me recently uh, are the pull request helpers from the use this package. And they have this really nice um, workflow described for, and this is these tools are there for when you want to contribute to someone else's code base. And they've designed a set of functions from R where you can fork and branch from someone else's repo and then contribute that as a pull request and then close it off in a you know nice neat way from the R Studio uh, interface, which is really, really nice. And I've got that um, those pull request helpers linked here. I've only just been learning them recently and I found them to be uh, a big uh, improvement. Then I've also got uh, listed here the GitHub command line interface manual, as well as the Git manual itself, I found really useful. Um, I constantly am failing at understanding the structure of Git trees and how and where um, commits and get. I tried feature branch development. I've tried uh, forks and branches. I'm still getting constantly confused. And there are times where I wanna just chuck in the whole Git thing because I feel like, oh, now I have to stop and spend two hours dealing with GitHub issues. And this has nothing to do with the actual science that I wanna do. This is just me failing at Git. And however, despite that, I've found that the, the benefits that I've got from it haven't been the benefits that I were looking for yet. Um, still working on developing those skills, but I found that the, the skills that I picked up and the project, project management particularly that I've picked up along the way has been really beneficial. So now opening it up to your stories, tell me about your Git fails. Has anyone else struggled with using Git? Please tell me I'm not the only one who finds it hard. Oh, there's probably questions too. I can see we have new messages. Everyone really <laughs> felt for your uh, <laughs> struggles. <laughs> uh, yes, more than once. Yes, where you somehow managed to balk the GitHub repo and I found that burning it down, I've needed to do both at the Git level and on the local level. So there are times when I've had to just delete everything on my machine and then copy what I have on Git. And then there have been other times where what's on Git is so woefully broken that I don't know how to walk it back or unpick it, but what I've got on my machine works. So now I need to either overwrite or yes, at times create a whole brand new repo and just, I'm just changing the repo name. And um, one thing that happened with that reboot as I switched from Metasim, oh, if I can show you my, I had a, I had a, um, on my Metasim package, I had someone open up an issue just recently and say, error, fail to install Metasim. And to which I had to respond with, I'm so embarrassed. But it turns out this is an old version of this code and I've now rebooted it in Simita. You need to go to a completely different repository because this was an old one that I burned down my local machine, decided to start all over again. And so the whole kind of it's just on Git makes it sound so much simpler than I think it actually is in practice. Yeah. I think that's also nice for the newer comments coming in that it's really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and so they either don't have an account or haven't started working with it. I have a Git workflow that I've created through pain, pain, blood, and tears. Oh, thank you so much for saying this. Oh, this is so reassuring. It's a way I can I insult this. Git for as long as the days I still use it, but I am at war with it. It was my pain, blood, and tears. Um, <laughs> And it feels like it's an eternal process of pain, blood, and tears. Like that, the pain never stops with Git. Yeah, and and you know, any any major action could be the one that makes a horrible steaming mess. Uh huh. And then informative commits. 
but like you're meant to use an informative message with your commit, but after a while, my commits get kind of lazy and they just become update or more words. Like if I, if I did a data analysis of my commit messages, <laughs> it'd be like 90% updating and more words, which isn't Mixing really- typos. <laughs> yeah, or typo, yes. <laughs> and then when I'm trying to scroll through and I'm meant to be able to surf back, you know, to find the bit where I've got actual code I want to go back to, trolling through all these commit messages of update. And I know that there is, there are, I was shown some ways to squash commit messages and all this other stuff, but that just means learning more Git skills and I'm finding pushing and pulling hard enough and <laughs> branching hard enough. Yeah, I usually, if I get into trouble, it's usually because I've done branching. Oh, but yes. Yes. So the question about, so why have it? Um, it is literally so that you, you have both the current version, which you like, and the previous version, <laughs> if you realize that actually you got rid of something you shouldn't have done. Yeah. And that's, in theory, this is so wonderful. It. And in practice, yeah. it's actually... I mean, I have never yeah. met a version control system that wasn't a pain. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I, I suspect I'm probably the only dino here who used CVS. Um, but yeah, but it's, yes, they, they're all a pain and they're all a pain in different ways. And GitHub is something, Git is something that lots of people use. So it's kind of a standard pain. Yes. I heard that. And, and you can use it in a collaborative way so you can share the pain. I was hoping not to go off mute, but then you're making me. Oh, it's, I'm still it using it, me but I am going to moan about it. It's one of those things. <laughs> you know, I. It is, and you know, this is where um, I should move this, this slide. So just skipping right ahead, because I have this slide in here. This, this slide links to a tweet that I want to show you that I actually think is pertinent to what we're discussing right now. Uh, go back to where we're discussing this. Um, but last week I was um, discussing some ideas with, some Ver with Veronica about um, projects that we could work on. And she was telling me about a Shiny app that she has. And this is how GitHub can be amazing. Uh, yeah. This went back in time, five years ago, I cloned her repo and I went to, I ran the Shiny run app to see whether I could run a Shiny and it prompted me to install one package. So I installed the package and I was like, okay, what's next in the debugging before I can run this? And I installed the package and then hit run app and the freaking shiny app opened. And it was like, wow. oh my goodness, I'm running this locally. I have all the code right here. There are things that I know about shiny that I want to get in there and, and, um, and make changes and adapt. Like some things that I, I just immediately wanted to like fiddle with was the labeling to now I'm showing this, but I should say that Veronica is not an R programmer and uh, this was her first R project and possibly one of her only R projects. Veronica is in machine learning and uses other languages and is very, very brilliant. Um, but I think this was just the most heroic reproducibility. We were able to go back in time. She didn't have to dig through her computer. We just found it on GitHub. And so to me, this is, you know, there are, yeah, version control is great, but there are these other perks to using Git and version control that just, that even if you're failing at using the version control stuff optimally, which I think for, there is a, a, a very, from the messages, very much a shared experience thereof. There are lots of benefits to using Git despite that. She just mentioned that that was the first time she put something on GitHub, which is amazing. I think the first time I, I put something dead. on GitHub, it was just a disaster. <laughs> I know. Like, how many? I, yeah, if I went back to my first repo on GitHub, I have no confidence you'd be able to run anything that was in it at all. It just blows my mind that it, it just worked out of the box. So when does that happen? Um, 
and so, Susanna is also replying saying short term yes but also you had this idea which seemed like it was great then you rewrote a bunch of code that way and then it turned out just fundamentally not work but fun- that just fundamentally not work for what you had to do so you can go back to the old code yes and when this works this way it, you know it's fantastic there are real benefits to adopting it I'm just not fantastic yet at being able to surf across my own code and find the, that I know that's coming when people tell me that you know people who are more advanced with git make good use of those aspects um, oh another thing that I find really useful about git is that you can use Travis uh, automatically with the use this package it has this fabulous function use this use Travis and you just run that and it automatically sets up your Travis for you. And Travis is really cool because when you push your code up, it automatically runs a whole bunch of checks on your code and sends you an email if it fails any of those checks. So it's a way of automating debugging to some extent. And if you build unit tests into your code, you can make those debugging checks really quite specific. Um, What's Travis? Ah, Travis. So it's a, it links in with your GitHub account and go into Travis. And every time you push, what it does is it, it builds your package and then runs some checks on it. Oh, apparently I'm not signed in. Um, I need to get up. And let me see whether I can easily get into my Travis. And yes. Okay, so it's got a whole bunch of um, linked repositories and as you see, they're all failing. So um, what it does is it, but in some of these, I don't care if it's you know failing, it's, it's checking and it's running software engineering style checks. So it does the package build and running and it runs the R command check function automatically for you. And this happens every time you push to GitHub. So in a way, it's every time you save your work properly, it will check a whole bunch of things for you using software engineering. So the more we can harness software engineering tools, the more a tool like Travis is useful. Um, but even when I've got lots of tests built into it, such as with Simita, um, it still ends up failing. And you know, I've got debugging to look into and why does it? And it was looking like, you know, this is because this was worked on a while ago. There are now all these dependencies and software is updated, um, Ramit is also failing. Oh, that's depressing. Um, so um, at some points, at one point these were in the green, but they're now in the red. And these are the two packages from uh, Parameter and Simeter. These are the two packages that sit underneath my thesis. But the things that they're failing on, and so this is, it's like there's elements that are really good because it'll run my unit tests but often I found that the things that we're failing on were things that in a scientific analysis, I don't necessarily care about. So working optimally with Travis checks is not something I've completely mastered yet, but I think that there's utility there. I just haven't optimized for it, but it does help me know that I have that as a toolkit. And in case I want to have some really robust quality control, in where every time I push up to GitHub, it checks certain things computationally for me. I know how to build that into the, um, the package in theory using Travis. I think you also missed a question earlier, which um, has been referenced again now about GitLab. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah so the GitLab is a, an alternative to GitHub and um, GitHub ultimately you you need to pay for certain features and I think GitLab might be free is that right is that the what is our what is the does anyone know what the um I've heard there be some um reasons to switch to GitLab and I just so I think it was mentioned that it's uh, better for more secure data if I uh, ah. I'm not missing between different messages right now um and they do have a free plan, it seems like, but some uh, features may not be available in their free plan. Right. And I mean, similarly, Git, I only use GitHub, the free plan. Um, and personally, I use GitHub because it's the most 
broadly used um, platform. And I tend to go with defaults on everything unless I'm pushed into choosing a different um, option. But GitLab, I, I understand lots of people use it very happily and very successfully, and it's fairly analogous to GitHub. And there are actually some good reasons to use GitLab, but I haven't, I have no expert in um, why that might be. It's on my long list of things to look into. Um, yeah, so if someone knows more about GitLab, feel free to either just chime in or um, write in the chat. But till then, Sumit had a few questions, but he also has his hand raised. So I'm just going to let him take the floor. Oh, yeah, go for it. Thanks, Divya. So uh, I, I do not have any experience with GitHub, and my question was not related to Git, uh, GitLab either. So uh, I work on a very controlled uh, data set for financial uh, you know, transactions. And that is why we cannot post anything on internet. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing is that uh, the kind of work which I do is an uh, analysis of that uh, data and then you know find out uh, what are the good things, bad things, and the ugly things about it. So we, we, use, uh, we, we started off with Excel. And uh, the time when you know, I, I was learning R and uh, I, I persuaded that we should move to R, uh, the question was because we are talking about reproducibility right now, so that is why you know I, I thought that I'll just put my mute off and then talk about it a little bit. So the biggest challenge in the reproducibility of an R code was that it has to be done on shiny, right? Because otherwise, my my audience is is not tech savvy. They they are like five year old kids, so they they acquire diagrams, they require charts, they require things like that, beautification of the data. So. Shiny, the problem was either the company has to go ahead and take uh, an enterprise level security of R Shiny, or else just discard the entire proposal of using R in order to get you know the work done. The sad story is that they switched back to Excel rather <laughs> you know trying to go to R and see what the heck is going on. And eventually, you know, I was thrown there's a software called as a, a web-based ui based software altrix or altrix i don't know how to pronounce it uh, which is which is a pricey software and uh, it, it, it is a subscription-based software so now i am i ended up working on altrix creating workflows uh, and everybody is happy paying more and nobody was interested to pay you know pennies for a shiny server and that is a sad story altogether and now, after working on a GUI-based drag-and-drop software, I am become complacent that I don't want to type on R code now. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a real sad story. And then eventually, stupid me, I, I jumped you know, to the gun and I jumped myself into an R versus Python World War Three <laughs> to find out which is better. And eventually lost good six to eight months in, in, you know, jumping off between Python and then R and then Python again, and then back to R. Because it is it was like, a you know, the, the, the law of the queue. The queue in which you are standing would apparently would, would move slower. And the moment you jump to another queue, you will see that the previous queue you were in is moving fast. And the, now this new queue is going slower. So every time I used to learn Python, some or the other, you know, either, either, some uh, meetup would come and then they would talk about R and I was like, all right, let's jump to R now. And then when I'm working on R, some person would just make me go to Python once again because of some good reason. So yes, uh, this, this is a long list of failures which I've had and you know, some because of me, some because of others, but uh, yes. So in terms of reproducibility, the point is that I, I guess it is uh, completely dependent upon your organization, whether they agree to your proposal or not. Mm -hmm. Such a good point. Right. And uh, the second thing is not everyone would like to have their hands dirty uh, on a, you know, a programming based software, although it may be really, very really powerful, but then they would eventually don't want to because they are not analytical people. They are the financial managers, they are like that, right? So they would want to see the numbers, the final numbers and all that, but they do not want to get their hands steady. So I guess, uh, you know, it, it entirely depends upon uh, what your audience is. And then you would have to bend down according to their wishes because at the end of the day, they are paying for that stuff. 
That's so true. And I found that managing my projects via GitHub was all well and good for me. But then if my collaborators don't use GitHub, then all of that project management is, you know, kind of useless. Um, and I really feel you on the, I think that was a, <laughs> that was a great anecdote that highlighted multiple problems. Um, that there are benefits, but that, you know, each of these techniques that we, we would adopt to achieve our good enough reproducible scientific computing come with a whole bunch of fails and problems and obstacles. And it's not to say that we shouldn't use them. I'm finding them really useful now, but this talk is highlighting exactly that kind of stuff. I love the stories you're sharing with me. It's just great. Keep them coming. Um, the, it's um, midnight and my mute is off. <laughs> it's midnight. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to talk. I'm only supposed to chat. Divya knows, everyone knows that I only chat at the point in time. I don't talk. But this this is a different this is a different medium altogether. There, there are two um, recommendations. I am not sure if this was in relationship to what you just said, Sumit, but um, Susanna says to use the reticulate package and use both. Um, ah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, reticulates for, I think, using Python in R. Uh, is that right? Does anyone have the answer to that? I'm sorry, what was the question? Yes, that is. Yeah, it is for using Thanks Python. Enough. Enough. <laughs> um, so, Sumit, that was just to tell you um, to use the reticulate package and then you can use R and Python together. Yeah, but I've become complacent now. <laughs> I also came across a, a different, um, like a far more, I, would, I had a meeting with a, a, an analyst, Ross Gaylor who um, works on you know, high powered analysis for the finance industry and has a lot of privacy you know, concerns with his data, protected data. And he introduced me to some cloud-based you know, um, uh, encrypted uh, tools that you can use if they be subscription based. And he showed me one tool that seemed really good whose name is escaping me. Um, but again, I'm, I'm kind of with you. There, these things are out there. But for me personally, I'm often looking for this minimalistic workflow where I can just adopt a few of these things because I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be, I'm, I'm just attempting, knowing I'll fail at being good enough. And, and it's about looking for what is good enough in the specific context. And I think that the context, I think there's some really good points highlighted by people who have spoken and, um, and spoken in the chat as well about how the context really shapes what tools from reproducible computing are relevant, like um, whether or not we, we, we care about Git and version control and pull requests, that kind of thing. Um, if none of your collaborators are going to do pull requests, then I'll, that, that cuts out a whole bunch of, you know, like the, the complexity of using Git if it's just you. So, it's all dependent on your context and who you're collaborating with and what will be obstacles and what will be useful, I think, is dependent. So there's no one size fits all. Or if, even if you are at all collaborating at that level that your collaborators need to see your R code, uh, all my, I mean, 12 co-authors were happy to not see my code <laughs> and that, just be that. like just show us the results show us the graphs um and please put it in word where we can track change uh oh, yes yeah. i mean the document itself is such a struggle isn't it and i mean this is where i think you know the the functions and documentation aspect is more for us than it is necessarily for you know yeah. looking outwards like how can i make use of the structure of um that's you know how do i use these reproducible skills and by bundling up our functions in package in you know, bundling up our code in functions then it's more accessible and in that sense it's more reproducible where people can understand what the code is doing because they have a nicely documented uh you know script and they can also look in the help documentation. But in yeah. practice, I found this was, you know, I failed at this, um, you know, enormously. I, I had like written these beautiful documented functions for other people and um, to use. And in my experience, my collaborators never made use of them. 
um i'm so happy to hear you say that 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 you failed and just that pull and push is the extent of good practice i'm like yes master that i am done with git <laughs> and you know with git yeah that's like for now i don't really care that much like it's i when i really need to go back and surf through my code i will look up how do i you know what's an optimal way to to go back through my git history but for the most part i don't make use of all of those features and i think it's really easy to get stressed um by the sheer complexity each of these tools comes with this huge complexity but for most of our context we don't care and yeah. we'll fail at a whole bunch of stuff but was that the stuff that really mattered or you know because what really matters is that we make our paper yeah yeah i i think i missed a few things uh, pavitra you said something about another package and i don't know if i missed over it like skipped over it you want to oh, yeah. just put that in the chat again or talk about it again and somebody had their hand raised and now Ooh, doesn't yeah. <laughs> and i'm so sorry we got lost chatting but i did see your hand so if you just want to um raise your hand again um yes yay <laughs> yeah it was me i just in that battle i was interested in knowing what were the reasons what were the motivations for some to to switch between python and r what was the how to say oh. the existential struggle <laughs> no i'm interested because i am also thinking because i do machine machine learning and i'm i started with r and i would like to continue with r and stick with it but everyone else is using python so i kind of feel the pressure to <laughs> oh, switch yeah. over so i don't know <laughs> well, welcome to my life uh, eight months before <laughs> okay <laughs> what what eventually i figured out is that r if if you're not using uh, if you're not going to go into machine learning at all do not even get into python python is is a general programming language right uh, and r is as not a general programming language it is statistical uh, statistically advanced uh, programming language so uh, uh, matt dance sure, i hope i'm pronouncing him, his name right uh he he has uh, said a nice statement that r is for research and python is for production and i guess this is right if you want any, any anything to related to machine learning or or you know advanced uh, decision trees and ql kms clustering and all that by all means go ahead and uh, do python uh but if you are only and only specifically looking for research and this is statistical computing and all that be with r for the pointer don't even go to python go to julia if you are looking for a statistical uh, uh, you know programming language and all that but uh, that that is what i found out uh, unfortunately in eight months and uh, you know uh, i mean i'm i'm happy i'm sad in both ways because eventually now my my you know i'm i'm crystal clear in what i want now and i hope it helps uh, to you too as well so but i i have a quick question sorry uh, I, I, i guess I, it is I'm sorry please do Samit is that the question that you've written there Yes 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 um, that one Sorry just before that I think I missed something from Pavitra as well that I haven't uh, mentioned and go for it I can Oh I found it um she mentioned Alterex that supports R connectors Yes yes it does it okay, does Okay so that was another suggestion and now Samit you can carry on Take so by yeah by default python and r both uh, work on a single core of your system how how do you easily make it uh, to to you know compute with all the cores that you have on your system i have been struggling on to that maybe it is pretty advanced for me at the moment uh, but i've been struggling uh, on, on, for that especially on the system which is being given to my by me by my office my macbook is still okay you know uh, all these statistical software they work great on macbook but uh, unfortunately i have a dell laptop windows system uh, given by my office and i have to work on that somehow so if if anybody can please help me out if it is uh, you know not siding away from the, your the topic yeah. um well I'll mention two things for multi core processing that um i've used that are helpful uh yes r is 
designed for single core processing, but you can kind of hack your way through it in a few different ways. So one way is that there are specific functions within statistical tools that you can use to turn on cores. So in, in the multi-NMA package, which I'm using for Bayesian network meta-analysis, I can set this option and uh, this will detect if I have parallel cores and then use parallel core processing. But the other tool that I'll mention at this point is per, per, um, so you can use, instead of using per in, um, from the tidyverse, you can use fur, which makes use of your multi-core processing. Um, and this, this speeds up your code. Um, but I'm sure other people will have other uh, you know, recommendations for multi-core processing and R. To, um, but I thought I'd just get that started. Um, but maybe I'll move on to, shall I move on to the next topic? And because I'm sure, you know, more side things will come up. So functions and documentation. This one, I wrote these very elaborate functions. And if I go into my before, I, you know, and I, I didn't check this actually, I, I just know that they're in there. If I go into my code and look at my functions, I'll find that there is, you know, fairly detailed information about these. And I've got, yeah, okay, so not too much information. I've just got parameters. But if I go into the similar package, I'm sure I'll find even more complicated documentation for my functions. So, um, and, and the thing is, I never really, I sort of made use of it, but only for myself. Oh, here I don't really have, yeah, this is just doesn't have a lot. I wonder whether if I go back to the smaller functions, like default parameters, no, that's the data set, um, intervention proportion. Yeah, there's each of these, I, I wrote them so that other people could look at them, but no one ever did. And in the end, I, I ended up just working with one very basic trial function and none of the documentation ended up being, you know, perfectly up to date when I finished. And one of the reasons that I've never released the software is I haven't gone through and updated all the documentation. And documentation is ostensibly good. It provides us with a way that we can look up our functions in our um, code. And I am using this right now. So I mean, here I am in my happy pill pain repo. And uh, if I load up, if I take a look at um, function documentation, so assign time points and take a look. I've got some notes for myself about how this function works. This, this is really useful at the moment. I have little um, notes to myself about, so here I've got some more details for myself. So best not to be too ambitious if the original data set is also given as an example. And, and in the end, I'm using my function documentation less as something when I started out, I, you know, with parameter and scimitar, I was sort of thinking, well, how do I build the function documentation so other people can read it? And I never really feel like I, I got all that good at it and ended up, ended up finding it frustrating having to maintain this document information at the same time and worry about how someone might read it when, you know, of course, in the end, no one has. Um, and I, I think that there's, 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 it's emerging as a theme with this talk is, you know, how there are all these techniques and tools that we talk about with respect to reproducibility, but I think how they're useful to us in scientific analysis is quite different to how they're useful to us in um, broader software engineering issues. Um, and so in my happy pill pain, I'm using my documentation as a lab notebook for myself for details about that particular function. And I just write down the things that seem super important and nothing else, because I know this code, I'm working on it right now. And I don't expect my doc, my doc, my functions to be fully documented. But I spent a lot of time, you know, dithering about in these two packages that sort of sat there for two years being picked up and dropped. And a big part of it was, I wasn't sure how to structure the functions um, optimally. And the bigger my simulations got, the more I ran into time problems and started to face the prospect of do I need to rewrite my functions in C 
Do I need to learn all new, you know, skill sets? And I ended up ultimately deciding I really didn't want to uh, learn a whole other programming language and, and to be working on, on making the code run a lot faster. So I ended up using the structure of the functions far more than I expected to achieve my time goals. My time goals were not about it running for someone else quickly. It was more about my own sanity because if it takes half an hour for the simulation to run, I can just go have a cup of coffee. But if it takes three days, it can be absolutely gutting when it doesn't run. And I have gone through so many different iterations with how to document and write functions. But in the end, I've kind of come back around in this, now that I'm working on this happy pill pain, and my functions are really, I think of as a lab notebook. And I'm keeping you know, blocks of code together, and I'm really just divvying it up in terms of how and where I think the troubleshooting will happen, not about some end user. So my, my, all my failures in writing functions and documentations have culminated in some really useful skills now that I'm finding it a lot easier. And when I came to, uh, I think I forgot, mm, if I go back to the manuscript in this, which is just in here, I found it to be a really useful thing having this way of um, splitting my code up into functions and being able to see my tool chain of my analysis just in the very preliminary run where I've got one network built, being able to see, oh, okay, so this is a function that I wrote, um, preliminary scrub, extract observation, that's a function I wrote, and net sleep, and being able to divide my code up so that I can see how my analysis is structured is really useful. But I don't feel like I was using or, um, and I've got my slides out of see, I clicked on the wrong one, okay? There we go. Um, I don't feel like I optimally made use of this. Um, but now having failed a lot of function structures, I feel like it's made my workflow a lot clearer and building the code flow a lot clear clearer. So what are some um, resources that I'd like to highlight? The, you know, the R textbooks for writing functions are really useful, but also the number one resource I wanna highlight when writing functions is Vignette RD. And this takes you to a really nice, we'll just run it now in our studio. This opens up a really nice Vignette on using Roxygen documentation. And uh, if you're using a packaged analysis, you can simply use the use this, use Roxygen. Um, I think it's use Roxygen. Huh. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, no, that, that is the function, use Roxygen MD. Um, ah, use Roxygen. This function will enable you to use um, Roxygen documentation with markdown syntax in all of your function documentation, which is really handy. And then you have this um, help vignette that describes standard practices for how we document functions, which I also find very useful. So that those are the two, um, the resource, that's the particular resource I wanted to highlight with respect to functions. Now, um, Tell me your function failing stories. Does anyone have any horror stories about like structuring code? I'm just looking to see whether anyone Um, Charles, can I say something? Please do. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your stories and all the difficulties. But that, that is very encouraging for me. I'm very beginner, and I'm not telling that I have a story. I had, um, I, I did some um, some R analysis and from my master degree, but after like two years, I forgot it, <laughs> and it's not like really um, installed. So I always have problem writing codes and these things. And now, um, yeah, facing my, um, I mean, 
I, I need to do analyze my data, but it's so scary to to do that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm I really enjoyed your 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 stories and, and telling this. This is this is um, yeah. It's going to be very helpful and encouraging. And perhaps I do with more confidence and I go on, <laughs> keep going on here. Thank you all. Yeah. That is exactly what I'm trying to achieve. That is so reassuring to hear. Yeah, I was hoping that by sharing my stories of failure, others would find it encouraging and reassuring that we're all in this together and we're all failing every day together at all these reproducible workflows and tools. What have I got up next? Let's see. I clicked on the wrong one. <laughs> uh, Charles, just to give you a heads up, we have around 15 minutes left. Beautiful. All right. Let's move on to the next topic, testing and workflow. And okay, catching myself up. Right. Testing and workflow. This one's a big one for me. Oh, I tried so many different things. So in the, the before, and this isn't even, you know, before, before, but one way of checking is what my function doing is it doing what it meant it to do and you know all of this has been this grand journey of when you build an analysis you'll inevitably figure things out as you go and have to go back through your analysis and change certain variables certain columns certain calculations and this is where the wheels come off the wagon you know, you think that you have this, you know, wonderful, and it, and it spits out this beautiful analysis, but as soon as you change one thing, the whole pipeline breaks. And I have spent years thinking about how to fix this. And I have got somewhere. One of the ways that I went really deep was looking at how to use the test app package and use unit tests to check my, um, my simulation and my simulation algorithms really needed a lot of debugging and were pretty heavy duty. They would take, um, at the end, they took an hour to run and would run 200,000 different simulations. And uh, do I have the, now I don't have the, the simulation picture on hand. Um, don't stick by it here. Done. But I do, oh no. It's not in there. Um, I did have the PhD open for this and then somehow managed to close it. Um, anyway, the, I, I, these, are, these are the tests that I worked out for it. And, you know, at first I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to do fuzz testing and fixed testing. And so um, with the, let's see, I'd, I'd say it's probably MetaSim maybe. You, no, maybe not this one. Um, there's medicines perhaps where it goes to did we test meta trial no test sampling there's yeah okay so here we've got you know it gets ever bigger and the calculations got more and more complicated with my unit tests and in the end i ended up like deleting a huge amount of my unit tests because I spent more time debugging the unit tests than I did on, you know, it started to become where the, the tool that I was meant to be using to help with the debugging was just creating more parts. So in, uh, but all that time I spent kind of trying and failing at these, you know, and I ended up with more and more code to do with testing my functions and seeing whether they worked. Ultimately, I ended up just wanting to know, did the, did the function run and did it output <coughs> what I expected. So recently I have been, and, and what this, what, the, what I came to realize was that in an analysis workflow, what's important to me about unit testing is quality assurance and testing the pipeline of my analysis. I don't need to test for it to be robust to every user. And unit tests and, and the whole kind of testing interface is really designed for this output software product where you might want to test lots of different inputs. So what happens if the person puts a character string in instead of a number? And you know, does it output an informative error message and things like that? But for an analysis, I'm not so worried about people misusing my functions. I just want to know that it runs and it works. So in the last two weeks, while I've been preparing this talk, I actually got introduced to a brand new tool. This is my after. This is, uh, this is a visualization produced from the targets uh, package. And 
targets, I've got a link to the uh, targets book here in the resources section. Targets is, a, is another way of building a kind of quality assurance in a sense in your pipeline. And it's got elements that are similar with unit tests, but it's also got things that are quite different. Uh, and I've, I've had some trials and tribulations with this, but the tribulations are definitely outweighing it. This is the successor to Drake, if you've ever heard of Drake. Drake was on my big long list of things that I wanted to look into, but didn't end up. And the cool thing about targets is that I load up the package targets and then in my analysis, and this is my happy pill pain analysis, I can inspect this, this network and it gives me this um, lovely visualization of all the functions in my analysis. And this picture reflects that um, from my, this workflow here. So this workflow I have in my manuscript reflects the same functions that are detailed here. And it shows the functions that I go through. So from reading in the um, raw data to produce the data. So there's the reading in the data and then cleaning the names and so on. And because we're starting to run short on time, I won't um, bang on and on about targets, but suffice to say that I've taken a lot of the things that frustrated me and made me happy about tests and then moved them into this new targets workflow framework. And I found it to be really useful. And whilst I failed a lot of unit tests, there was a lot that was beneficial. And um, we're running short of time now. So I don't know how, like maybe if people have so, like quick comments they make, want to make about failing at testing and workflow. I have a quick comment on your GIFs. This is so good. <laughs> I, I took a lot of joy in selecting like, <laughs> I'm a big old movie buff. So I was like looking up on my favorite movies and then finding like scary, unhappy GIFs from them. I took a lot of joy in this. And I got my slides out of sync again. I keep clicking. This is a presentation with, I'm working on the, the presentation notes. So, um, this like really nicely takes us up to the final part of the talk, where I just want to flag that there are these, you know, really unexpected perks of adopting reproducible scientific practices, like how I was able to really easily reproduce Veronica's Shiny app on my machine because I was interested in adapting and extending it. And I now feel like I can just hit the ground running with extending it because I've got it right here and it already runs. Um, and I don't think that, you know, Veronica had that in mind that someone five years hence might want to adapt and extend this for a brand new paper when she built this shiny app, but it's this unexpected perk of adopting a reproducible workflow. Um, project management, there's been a whole bunch of things that I've adopted from all these failures and frustrations. And so ultimately, I just want to come back to this message of if you failed at adopting any aspect of these techniques of reproducible science, it means that you tried. And when you try, you won't get everything right, but you will have tried to adopt a workflow, which means you learned something about that particular technique. And hopefully I've illustrated in these stories that other people have shared have illustrated that there are all sorts of ways that they can benefit and also frustrate, that it's not perfect and clean, but it's still really worthwhile. And that I think that failing is the best we're going to do. So let's fail collectively and learn together. And that takes me to the end of my talk, right on time. Um, and I, so I thought maybe now I can just open up to any comments or questions or discussion that people like to have. Well, the comments I see here are just overwhelmingly positive. Um, not just okay. the last few, but all of them. <laughs> And a special thanks to Charles for doing this at 4 a.m. <laughs> it, yeah, it is now 5 a.m. local time, but I'm currently living on UK time because I started my postdoc, but I'm not in the UK yet. So I'm living in two time zones. It's very strange. 
12.23 a.m. Thank you so much for joining in the middle of the night. <laughs> I'm really honored. Thank you so many people for joining me. I'm surprised. I'm genuinely surprised to get this large an audience for a rambling talk about my failures. Um, and there are but I got a lot. <laughs> there are a few different comments saying they're now going to go back and try things that they had just given up on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's amazing how so motivating uh, talking about failure can be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of surprising. I, I guess um, failure has been coming up a lot because I've been, uh, you know, writing this blog post for the How I Fail blog and Veronica is quite the specialist in failure and it feels like it's a running theme and that I feel like in the end doing my PhD was kind of a meditation on failing at all of science. And even though I finished now and, uh, you know, submission went really smoothly and I got a postdoc. So that makes me look like it was all really neat and clean. But in fact, the whole thing was a mess. And I spent most of my PhD feeling like I was failing at just everything that I set out to do. I, I really resonated with that when you started your talk with just like, why was I even doing this? And then I thought, well, if I stop now, I would have just failed at everything. If I keep going, maybe I succeed. I was just like, I resonate with that. <laughs> at some point in your PhD, you're just like, should I stop now and just have failed a few years or should I keep going and maybe get a few publications out of it? Ah, uh, yes. I ended up getting publications that I did not expect out of it. I ended up writing papers on workflow yeah. and um, didn't publish the papers on meta analysis of mediums that I expected to publish. Yeah. Well, everyone's saying thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us from very different time zones from 12.33 a.m. to 12.55 p.m. <laughs> Um, to well, Charles at four, well, five a.m. <laughs> well, we have people from every time zone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Charles. Um, thanks, Veronica, again for the link. Um, we will put all the material up on GitHub as usual, um, and we will have the talk uploaded on YouTube on the global channel by the weekend. Thank you, everyone.